Hi everyone. Um, we will be talking talking about Keyhouse, a key management system that's ready for production. And um, we work for a company called ByteDance. It was founded nine, roughly nine years ago. We have a lot of products. Um, most famous one is TikTok. Um, and a couple of words about ourselves. Uh, so building. Um, leads trusted computing and secure coding initiatives at Bidens, and he's a big supporter of Rust. He, he's, he's maintaining Apache T-Clave, uh, which is an open source uh, universal secure computing platform. And before that, he worked at Baidu on similar problems. Uh, Max, who is with us today, is a very quick learner, and he is the primary developer on Keyhouse. So without him, this project wouldn't exist. He brings his Rust skills and like in general computer science skills and security skills to the table. And previously, Max worked on some anti-automation problems. And me, Sergey, uh, I work on, primarily work on like web security problems and uh, which includes anti-automation and uh, some browser security APIs and so on. So none of us had a prior key management system uh, development experience. So that's kind of more interesting. Um, so uh, what is Keyhouse? Um, it's an open source project, well, soon to be open source project, um, uh, completely written in Rust. Uh, and um, at Biden, security and privacy are top concerns. And uh, just a few words, how we started doing this is that there was an existing key management system that we were um, integrated, started integrating with uh, ZTI, with, the, with, with our new authentication uh, mechanism in our, in our company cloud. And while looking at the code, uh, several refactoring initiatives came to our attention. And at some point, critical mass of changes was so big that, uh, so, so, so was so massive that, um, we decided to rewrite everything from scratch. And while there was no uh, massive Rust projects in the company, like we were allowed to, man management allowed us to experiment with Rust for a bit and maybe rewrite some, some, some small components in Rust and see if uh, performance benefits or any other benefits overweigh uh, a steep learning curve and like we can, we, we, we can benefit from it. And yeah, it was, it went so good that um, within a couple of weeks, uh, we wrote a minimum, minimum vi viable product and we were amazed with the performance and scalability and like memory safety guarantees that we were allowed basically, or we were, we got a support to implement everything from scratch, 100% in Rust. And um, <clears throat> Um, yeah, so our, our Rust deployment, uh, you know, this project has, has since matured at ByteDance and we're deployed in production um, all across the world now. Um, so, you know, we can say this project has internally been a success and part of our open source initiative is turning this into a success for everybody else. Um, yeah, so thanks, Sergey, for telling us uh, stuff about why Rust. Um, so I'll, I'm Max, I'll be going into some of the design considerations in Keyhouse. Um, so starting off here with our core components, um, everything in Keyhouse is designed around kind of like a monolith, uh, kind of like end product in that, you know, you ship like just one service out that provides Keyhouse and then you, you know, you balance that out amongst many pods or, or whatever, it would be horizontally scaled, but just one you know, like category of service. Uh, the reason being is just minimizing chances of failure, man, uh, minimizing um, any kind of like potential dependency problems and uh, just overall trying to maintain as much simplicity as possible because as it turns out, key management systems tend to be dependent on by a lot of critical services. We really, really need that top reliability and that top, um, top like uh, just reliability and redundancy. So we just don't have any room for failure. So uh, a lot of our design considerations go with that in mind. Um, and with that in mind, as a monolith, we have uh, kind of like two halves to our program. Uh, so we have our data plane, which is what our SDKs talk to. Um, and then we also have our control plane, which is what like you uh, or an operator or administrator would talk to, to you know, create new keys and, and do other administration operations. 
Um, uh, and in general, you could say uh, the each component of key house is designed to be very easily hot swappable at the build phase. And um, we did this kind of with a uh, a service as a library approach where you would import key house almost as a library and then fill in whatever implementations you need to integrate with your own corporate infrastructure. The idea being, okay, you know, as ByteDance, if this was somebody else's open source project and we have all the specific infrastructure requirements we need to fulfill, how can we get this open source project to mesh with our own internal systems? Um, and so we tried to make it an approach so that we could both answer that question for us, but also answer that question for everybody else. Um, and so that's why we landed at this kind of hot swappable uh, system. So for example, like control plane authorization can be defined um, by any system, like some kind of SSO internal to a company, uh, just standard JBT tokens directly through Spire, Spiffy, uh, zero trust infrastructure, um, you know, anything works. Uh, and on a similar note, uh, like exact crypto algorithm support, um, and even like the back end itself, like we will probably we will primarily be talking about etcd here, but uh, you could swap out backends if other needs arose. Um, and this extends to a lot of other components of Keyhouse as well. Uh, speaking of etcd, uh, etcd is our, is if you're not familiar with it, a backend data store, and we'll be talking more about that shortly. Um, but it's ultimately like the the root source of all uh, like backend storage for Keyhouse. Um, etcd itself doesn't have support for spiffy spire zti which is what we use for um identity and attestation and ultimately authorization um we wrote another project called spire proxy that allows us to uh can allows us to provide the kind of like a a wrapper over etcd in order to um uh provide like that that spiffy spire attestation authorization and we'll be talking more about spiffy later on in the presentation um, also, generally speaking, KMS or uh, Keyhouse will also be talking to uh, NHSM hardware security modules, uh, hardware root of trust. We'll also be talking about that more later on. Um, so let's talk more about etcd. So etcd, as I said before, is our primary authoritative uh, backend data source. Um, every Keyhouse instance talks to etcd all the time. Of course, we do have failure like prevention. We have like kind of like failovers in place and stuff. Uh, but that's all ultimately up to how you want to deploy things. Um, we use spiffy IDs as a form of identity uh, between etcd and keyhouse, uh, so we're not relying on like username, password schemes or anything like that. Um, and you could set that up with other backend stores as well, but uh, like I said before, we'll be focusing on etcd. Um, and uh, in general, uh, etcd, if you're not already familiar with it, it is a uh, it's a very simple key value store with its primary selling points being high consistency guarantees very persistent, very reliable uh, load distribution, but it is distributed. Like generally speaking, you, you deploy with like five to seven nodes. Um, so uh, it's relatively scalable uh, for what we need. And it also, um, you know, it's also relatively easy to create replicas of both with etcd and as we'll be talking about right now uh, with read replicas and with caching. So uh, I guess in the last slide I talked about a little bit here, um, we do also create read replicas of etcd in order to deploy in our, uh, you with the same cluster data set across multiple regions around the world. Um, and, uh, you know, part of that is we have this really interesting kind of cache infrastructure in Keyhouse where uh, each Keyhouse instance, right? So each like pod running Keyhouse effectively becomes a replica of etcd in and of itself, a read replica that is. Um, and, you know, in, uh, you know, we kind of like more theoretical terms, this ends up being a kind of like a write through evictionless cache in that, Due to the, the generally low size of the entire data set, like I think our entire production network, uh, you know, it doesn't grow above a couple megabytes uh, for every, you know, encryption key there is because encryption keys just aren't that big. So what we end up doing is we actually just cache everything all the time in every key house instance, which provides amazing like failure, uh, you know, like, you know, just handling failures really well. Uh, Etsy goes down, key house just keeps trucking, like it's no big deal. Um, of course, we deny any rights during that time, but uh, and that's why we're right through is to deny rights when uh, etcd can't confirm anything. Uh, and in general, Keyhouse actually relies a lot on the kind of consistency guarantees that etcd provides in order to synchronize its operations. Um, and so that's a it's a very useful uh, you know feature provided by etcd. Um, 
And uh, yeah, this has given us great performance gains across the board. And ultimately, if you think about it, it makes it such that any given request that Keyhouse has to handle does not have any direct network dependencies, which is both, at least other than the request itself, of course. Um, and so this results in uh, just like a really reliable um, like request serving uh, latency and in general, just high reliability of serving requests. Um, we talked a little bit about it before, but you know what is Spiffy? If you're not already familiar with it, it's an attestation and identity framework. Uh, it's an open standard, open source implementations and standard. Um, we mostly center around Spire at uh, Keyhouse and ByteDance. Um, our own internal deployment is using Spire. Um, and uh, if you're not already familiar with it, uh, Ultimately, what the usage of Spiffy Inspire provides is some kind of Spiffy verifiable identity document or SVID, um, generally in the form of an X509 certificate uh, signed by Spire through some form, or uh, an ES256 JWT uh, token containing a Spiffy ID, where a Spiffy ID is just a URI of a specific form. In Keyhouse, we place a, uh, a generalized form of this in that you have like Spiffy. Uh, and then you have like a trust domain, uh, and then you have a series of key value pairs, uh, which denote some property. The intention being that you can use wildcards to uh, be able to more generically refer to parts of a Spiffy ID. Um, so yeah, how does Keyhouse specifically use Spiffy? Uh, so in general, everything in Keyhouse is protected with mutual TL TLS. And uh, you know we're using Spiffy to communicate identity through this use of MTLS. So like SDKs will confirm the identity of the Keyhouse server it's talking to. Um, the server will confirm the identities of SDKs if applicable. Um, and you know on top of that, the Keyhouse will also use these identities to authorize resources. In uh, you know we'll talk more about the specific resources being authorized later, but the customer keys. Uh, that uh, a given request that the data plane is accessing uh, gets authorized to these Spiffy ID identities as well. So those URIs we looked at before. Um, and all of our integrations of this, uh, due to the general low uh, integration of Spire and Spiffy in Rust so far in open sourcing, we actually wrote our own implementation called Spire Workload RS. That'll also be getting open source at the same time as Keyhouse when that gets open sourced in the coming months. <clears throat> So uh, let's talk more about our key hier hierarchy. So in general, like K uh, Keyhouse it really revolves around a lot about envelope encryption. Uh, and we also put a lot of uh, you know, effort into hardware root of trust. So our master key, generally speaking, is stored at our at our in our in our HSM and it is you know really hardened down. It's in you know a lockdown cluster um, of like HSM modules with any implementation to find like backup system and access control outside of Keyhouse's hands. Um, and, uh, you know, to avoid, generally speaking, one would expect that to have a very like uh, low throughput for encryption. Like you're not gonna wanna send a bunch of stuff into your HSM. Uh, so we use an intermediate key that is directly encrypted by the HSM. Um, and this gets stored in etcd uh, at rest encrypted. Um, and this is used to encrypt all other data in etcd, generally speaking. So like customer keys uh, is our number one example. We'll talk more about those later, but those are really like our meat and bones. Uh, and that's what a lot of like access control and users kind of interact with. Data keys are uh, what we use at an SDK level to, uh, it's kind of like the end use key. Uh, you can think about it that way. So we made a master key. Um, these are generally manually rotated uh, by any like, you know, presumably you have some kind of like uh, operation in place uh, to, to create a new master key internally. Um, and then uh, you would just have Keyhouse uh, up, updated to uh, start, you know, uh, migrating all of the existing encrypted customer keys and intermediate keys around uh, this new master key. So our intermediate just key. To add, uh, the only time you would need to access HSM or any other like ha hardware root of trust implementing uh, storage uh, will be uh, at the startup when you need to decrypt uh, intermediate key. Uh, that's in re at rest or when you rotate intermediate key. Yeah, so uh, this ends up being that in our current defaults where we rotate intermediate keys every 24 hours and assuming you don't restart key house uh, very often that results in, in one encrypt in uh, uh, like end decrypt uh, operations one per pod 
uh, and then one encrypt operation to create a new intermediate key. Uh, and then each pod would have to decrypt the intermediate key on boot. Uh, that's kind of like the general uh, load on the HSM that's expected. Um, yeah, so our intermediate keys, uh, we've heard a little bit about these, but uh, these are, uh, as I uh, said, uh, are rotated once per day um, and are encrypted at rest by the, the master key in the HSM. Um, there can be more than one floating around uh, due to the way that Keyhouse uh, migrates customer keys when we rotate intermediate keys. Intermediate keys actually get stored alongside or they get copied alongside customer keys encrypted at rest. Uh, this way that in the when we rotate an intermediate key, um, you know, we can do it reliably uh, with each pod taking an arbitrary chunk of those customer keys and uh, re-encrypting them with new intermediate keys um, in a you know, highly reliable way, um, taking advantage of etcd's consistency to coordinate. Uh, so our customer keys, these are you know, our real meat and bones. Um, these are what access control lists live on. These also have an assigned purpose like, okay, these are for encrypting secrets. These are for encrypting data. Um, and uh, they never leave the key house. Uh, it's kind of like the, the lowest layer key uh, that is in key house server itself. Um, generally speaking, what happens with these key house, oh, these customer keys is uh, an administrator goes through, creates one, sets an access control list, and then we get to the data key. So what happens is, if you think about it from the SDK perspective, SDK wants to encrypt some data. Uh, SDK requests a data key from key house. Key house uses an, uh, a one-time uh, one password scheme, kind of like two-factor authentication to uh, generate a data key for a given day to uh, make caching uh, a much more reasonable thing to do because uh, we want to keep the number of data keys floating around for a given time period low. Um, generally speaking, we do one data key per day per customer key. Um, and so what key, uh, key house will do is it'll return the encrypted uh, data key and envelope encrypted by the customer key and the unencrypted data key to the SDK, which will then encrypt the original payload and store alongside the encrypted data key alongside it, along with uh, metadata that tags it along to uh, its owning customer key. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, it's, you know, ends up being this really clean implementation where, uh, the data never gets sent to key house. So it minimizes your bandwidth usage. Um, but we also, uh, avoid sending the customer key to the client and also minimizing the number of requests upstream to key house. This also provides us a lot of redundancy. So in the event that the key house server is down, uh, if the SDK can't fetch another data key, I mean, it's not great, but you know, you can have some leeway where like, say we try to fetch a new data key every six hours, but if it fails, well, we can wait another six hours. It only rotates every 24 hours anyways. Um, and you know, of course you wanna put strict limits on that to avoid any kind of problems, but um, it allows for a lot of extra fault tolerance um, and just improving that, that uh, you know, reliability guarantee. Um, so we talked a little bit about this before, but so secrets. So not everything can really fit into the neat box that is like a customer key, data key setup. Um, so say you have some persistent key you need to use for some other purpose, like a, you know, an HMAC key, uh, an immutable private key for some PKI stuff, um, some credentials uh, for some sensitive service. Um, you know, you can store these in a key house secret um, and they, they get stored in that CD um, uh, by a, a data key that doesn't leave uh, key house. Um, in a given customer key that's d d that is mutually exclusively assigned to only be able to encrypt secrets and not other data, we'll uh, uh, be able to have any number of these uh, associated with it. Um, so key rings. So key rings, this is not a type of key, this is rather a category or a, a grouping of customer keys, mostly used for operator and admin or slash administrator uh, uh, ease of use and convenience. Um, you can use these to to uh, kind of group together customer keys and like say share it to another operator. Um, and this is mostly all they're for is it's just a form of organization. Cause I mean, if you have one customer key per use case as you should, it's following good security principles, then you can end up with quite a few of them. And then, you know, you know, it's nice to be able to group them together into some like coherent grouping, say like X team or X service or whatever. So, uh, you know, we've talked a little bit about operators and how we're using access controllers at the customer key level. This is kind of like a full diagram of what authorization looks like uh, in Keyhouse. So you have some administrator, you know, they have access through some implementation to find uh, mechanism, you know, say like SSO or whatever. Uh, they have ownership of some set of key rings or access to some set of key rings. 
Um, and then each key ring has uniquely owns some number of customer keys under it. Like I said before, it's a grouping. And then each customer key has its own unique access control list, which define how it works at the data plane level. Um, and so the operators can then go into customer keys they have indirect control of and set up um, a uh, access control to whatever spiffy authenticated entities like service person, whatever your spiffy IDs represent, uh, and can set it up to uh, so that they ha have whatever specific access is necessary, reading secrets, writing secrets, uh, encrypting data, et cetera. So uh, next steps. Uh, currently, Keyhouse is not open source. However, we're working to open source it now. We've been working with some security vendors to uh, you know make sure everything's tip top shape. Uh, and we're also working to open source our Spire workload project uh, and Spire proxy as well, which is mostly just an offshoot of Spire workload. Um, and uh, yeah, those, those, we expect those to be open source in the next few months. We also want to uh, increase the number of integration for generic or open source implementations of uh, various components of Keyhouse, say like different open source metric servers, uh, like log, uh, different ways to, to gobble up logs, um, control plane authorization schemes, um, perhaps even different backend stores. So just maximizing our uh, kind of like ready to go on a lot of different open source, more open source uh, stacks. Um, and also we want to add support for asymmetric keys. Right now, Keyhouse is really, really tailored for what we need internally. Um, we've really designed it around what our internal uh, customers at ByteDance like, need for their different projects. Uh, and one of those things just hasn't been uh, you know, asymmetric keys stored in uh, Keyhouse. But so we still can store an asymmetric key as a secret. Yeah, you can store it as a secret, but like say automatic rotation or setting up PKI infrastructures is not something currently innately supported by Keyhouse as some special feature like we have for customer keys. Uh, it fits in pretty well, but we just haven't implemented that. Um, and so that's something we want to add in. Um, but yeah, in general, a lot of our design decisions have been primarily motivated by what we need to get this rolling inside. Uh, I think we mentioned a little bit before, but Keyhouse is deployed in production now at ByteDance and is now you know serving all the people on TikTok. Yeah, we can't really give out any, any concrete numbers, but uh, several pods of Keyhouse are serving tens of thousands of services. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, that's all we have here. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, and I think now we have some time for questions. Thank you so much. All right.